Good morning, Dog Nation. As you can see, things a little bit different here today, but still happy to have you for Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented by Kroger. You know, it's been a little bit of a weird week for us. We sort of dealt with some issues. And so we said on this particular Friday, the last Friday before Christmas, why not just sort of relax and uh, just kind of do it in sort of a laid back way. We have a special guest that's going to join us here in a a couple of seconds, which I'm really excited about. So let me give you an idea how the show is going to work. We're going to just, if you're obviously watching a video right now, you see I'm here at home today. Uh, getting ready for Christmas, you know, got decorations behind me. I got kids chomping the bit for presents and cookies and everything uh, else. So a, a lot of uh, really good stuff on the way, including today, very special guest, John Stinchcomb going to join us. We're going to look back on what Georgia was able to do with the 2024 recruiting class. We're going to look ahead to what's going to be an interesting week in Miami next week for Georgia, getting ready for the Orange Bowl and all the weird stuff happening around Florida State right now. And some of that is actually happening as we speak. So let's go ahead and get it started. Good to have you with us here on a Friday. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Kroger from my home. And it begins right now. Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Kroger, fresh for everyone. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. All right, this is a very different show for us. Let me take care of a little bit of business off the top, and then we'll kind of get into what I think is still going to be a really fun broadcast. Of course, we're happy to have you with us as you all are enjoying your Christmas and holiday season. So we are at home today for reasons that I'm sure by now, if you're a regular viewer, you're pretty familiar with. So we are at home today on all of that. Normally, Fridays in our show means Jeff Sintel. Jeff, not able to be with us today. So what we're going to do here in a moment is, in a very relaxed and casual way, we're going to bring in John Stinchcomb. In fact, let's go ahead and get ready to bring in John here right now and just have a really fun conversation. I've got some housekeeping stuff to take care of on the other side of this. We'll take your comments as we typically do. I'm going to speak directly to our podcast audience here coming up in just a few minutes there as well. But on a fun Friday, Friday before Christmas, John's got his Christmas attire on, which I love to be able to see. Uh, so in a day in which Jeff Sintel can't be here, boy, you talk about an amazing uh, guest to be able to have. Obviously, Monday or normal day with John is Christmas. So why not move this up and do it a day earlier than normal, or I should say a, a show day earlier, a couple of days on the calendar earlier. John, Merry Christmas. Welcome in to our program here today. It is a really great thing to have you with us here today. Well, glad to be here. And uh, Merry Christmas to you and yours as well, B.A. And I appreciate you kind of being a part of the conversation we're having. And I know you observe this stuff throughout the week the same way that I do. Obviously, I kind of live immersed in it. And, and to me, what's been so much fun kind of right here ahead of Christmas is the way we've kind of gotten back on track again. You know, the Carson Beck news uh, gave us that chance to feel good about the 2024 you know season for Georgia coming up again. And the conclusion of the 2024 recruiting class kind of gave us that almost sort of old school national signing day excitement that – seemed like it kind of been absent, not just for Georgia, but perhaps across the sport there as well. Signing day doesn't quite feel the same way that it used to in the transfer portal era, but uh, Georgia had a great Wednesday as well on what has now become National Signing Day. And so, John, I'm sure you're very much just like me, very happy to be having like good, fun Georgia conversations again. Obviously not in the college football playoff. Dog fans justifiably disappointed about that but over the course of the last couple of days nothing to be disappointed about we are we are truly back when it comes to all of that yeah in a season of chaos this has been a week that provides gift after gift and you start with the Carson Beck announcement that he's going to return and not only lead this team to the Orange Bowl but uh, will be leading this team next year that's great news and that was just the tip of the iceberg of, of more great things to come you look at signing day and the number one class in the nation, you look at all the position groups where we have the number one and number two, the number three player in their position group. Uh, it was a great opportunity to celebrate being a dog. Uh, and then in contrast, you look across the board and there's a lot of concern. If, I, if I'm sitting at Florida State, you're going, man, the, the news isn't nearly as chipper uh, down in Tallahassee. So so much to be grateful for and a week that we can certainly celebrate. All right, so let's try to walk through some of this here for a moment. And since it's kind of happening right now, I, I do want to talk to you about this. I, I don't even, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this. So I'm assuming that you're not either, but there's a board of trustees meeting at Florida State taking place here right now. And you want to talk about weirdness going into the Orange Bowl next week. 
you know, the idea that right now Florida State's essentially in a meeting talking about its future. Like, you know, this is a much bigger word that I should be using. And on a show like this, you should probably never hear. But there's a true like existential crisis taking place at Florida State right now where on the heels of, you know, a 13-0 and Power 5, you know, undefeated conference champion being left out of the playoff and having some of that, I believe, be used against Florida State on the recruiting trail here this year. You know, Florida State now kind of one more time kind of pounding that fist on the table saying, all right, once and for all, finally and forever, we have got to get out of the ACC and presumably pay whatever it takes to kind of break this contract. Legally, I don't know what's possible there on that. I assume it must be difficult because they've been trying to do this for a couple of years and haven't been able to. So legally, it must not be the easiest thing to do because their process of attempting this has been going on for quite some time. But we can also assume that if they finally figured out a way or if they're just going to like bull in a china shop, just sort of like smash and break whatever they have to in order to try to get their way. Boy, John, this has long term ramifications for college athletics almost for certain. But it also makes the Orange Bowl vibe completely different to think that you're playing a team that's trying to like break the system. They're trying to put the system on trial, you know, right before this game. How weird is all of that? Well, let's start with the orange bowl and work our way back through for Florida state and the general ramifications that, you know, the big picture has for them. I think for Georgia fans, it's similar to what we experienced, you know, that scorned, we feel insulted by being left out to the years, the few years ago when we played in the Sugar Bowl against Texas. And it was like, hey, we still have something to prove. But, you know, you get out there and your feelings are still hurt and, you're, and your attention is uh, split and divided in multiple places, not only for the players, but for the coach, uh, the coaches, the fan base. It was one of those where, you know, we shouldn't be here. Everybody should recognize that we shouldn't be here. And then the product was doo-doo, right? I mean, the Georgia went out there and played one of their worst games yeah. in recent memory uh, under the Kirby Smart era. So it we have been in a similar situation where you feel like we deserved better and our attention is now divided. We saw the product that took the field. That would be my concern if I'm Florida mm-hmm. State, if I'm focused solely on the Orange Bowl. Now, Let's recognize that the the landscape of college football has valued anything outside of college football playoffs. It's devalued to the point where it's like, what are we doing here? Yeah. And you look at the 12 game you know, projected college football playoffs and say, well, that's got to be a better model. Even though there are still teams that are left on the outside of that playing in bowl games that are meaningless, uh, similar to what we see here. Now for Florida State, big picture wise, I think what if anything, the committee, the college football playoff committee has said is if you're outside of meaningful football, if you're outside of the Big Ten or the SEC, then just know that your future is in jeopardy. And I think that's what FSU is is trying to come to grips with. We play in a conference that is second tier at this point, second tier in comparison to the big picture. So they're on the outside looking in. They're saying, We did everything we could possibly do in our conference, and it wasn't enough. So how do we avoid being in that situation going forward? That means we've got to get out, right? I mean, they're saying we've tried to get out before, and they did. And, you know, the ironclad agreement that everyone talks about, they're saying there's got to be a way because this conference does not provide an an opportunity and a pathway for us to reach the success that we want to seek on an annual basis. And if 13 and 0 in our conference can't get it done, what do we need to do to be a part of that conversation? And I realize that the fans don't care about like media stuff, but I do think about this type of thing where like when you're in Miami next week, there's a lot more media stuff going on than a normal game. It's just a week's worth of activities. And I sort of picture these moments when like Mike Norvell goes to these press conferences and things like that. Where, John, you know, the idea of, hey, how do you stop Carson back? That's not the question. The question is, what conference are you going to be in in a couple of years? And how much money are you willing to pony up? And who's going to provide that money to get you out of the ACC? Like, this is a very different type of discussion uh, taking place around a Georgia opponent. It makes next week in Miami, I think, pretty wild, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you have 10 questions for Florida State, any representative, coaches, players included. And the top 10 questions that you have for them have nothing to do with the game. They have nothing to do with 
How do you stop Georgia's offense? How do you, you know, prepare for the holes in the defense? Who do you expect in the game? No, it's more about, you know, how, how do you feel about the college football selection committee and what do you need to do about your conference and what happened in that meeting that we've heard so much about this past week? And, you know, there's so many questions that precede what should matter, and that's how do you prepare the for the opponent that you're fixing to face, who is was the number one team in the country for however many weeks and lost by three points on a neutral site against a top four team. So that's where the focus should be if you're only looking at football, but you're not. You're looking at a much, much bigger picture for Florida State. And I want to explain something because I'm seeing a lot of comments kind of rolling in about this, John, that people are kind of talking about Florida State being excluded from the playoff and saying, well, Clemson was in the ACC. They made the playoff. And if Jordan Travis hadn't gotten hurt, this wouldn't have happened. And things of that nature. I want to make sure I haven't said this properly. I just want to make sure people understand this, that Florida State's not looking to leave the ACC now because they missed the playoff. Missing the playoff is the sort of spice that kind of rekindles the conversation that has been happening. Florida State wants to leave the ACC because in future years with new, and I know that people don't like to talk about like contracts and media rights and things like that, but in this particular case, that's what this is about. Then in future years, compared to like the very big media contracts the SEC has, the Big Ten has, that Florida State is going to be paid on an annual basis about $30 million less than the teams they're competing with for these championships. And in a future world where player compensation may come from like the actual sort of coffers of the programs and not just NIL, that could be $30 million less, you know, less of like player payroll you have in some sort of future world here. So the playoff exclusion is, to use an old phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back. It's the financial hardship that the best ACC teams have in comparison to their non-ACC brethren. That's the real reason that Florida State wants out of the ACC. And to the people who are trying to push this, being left out of the playoff is just their sort of full and final excuse to do what they've been trying to do for a couple of years anyway. I want to make sure people understand that. Well, and, and, and to that uh, to that end, the NCAA is trying to stay relevant. They come out with, two weeks ago, a two-tiered system, right? So a tier one where we can do some profit sharing with the players and there's commitments from organ from athletic departments. That was a surprise to conferences. You, we heard, you know, multiple commissioners say, wow, that's the first I'm hearing of it. So it's their attempt to stay relevant, but it also speaks to this uh, stratification. There is going to be a tier one and tier two. As you look across the conference, you look at what UCO is coming out of UCLA with Chip Kelly and what he's saying is like, all right, let's, parse out college football away from all the other sports and find ways to profit share and find ways to look at a a system that identifies certain teams, 64 teams that are, you know, vying for that top tier, top level of play and then stratify out away from everyone else. So that is the direction that we're all heading. You saw with the, the transfers of teams into conferences that this isn't about, you know, uh, ACC not being, you know, uh, uh, still capable and relevant and all those things. You're looking at a stratification and money, as always, is one of the main components and drivers for this entire conversation. Well, speaking of Florida State, one of the big recruiting wins for Georgia going back to Wednesday was flipping K.J. Bolden away from Florida State. And as it turns out, the Seminoles, for many of the reasons we're discussing right now, may have been only third place in the uh, Bolden decision. But, John, that was that that sort of old school signing day fireworks that, you know, not only has not always been present with Georgia, but it hasn't really been present necessarily anywhere. You know, signing day just feels different than it used to be. My gosh, you know, Bolden was sort of a throwback to the most exciting moments when, you know, you, you see Georgia swooping in late to get a player I've seen in person. I, I think he's a truly special talent. I think he can have a great Georgia career. And, you know, I'm obviously curious what you th- think about all this, but specifically from this standpoint, that, in a day and age in which we're led to believe that some recruits, all they care about is whatever, you know, the the you know the, the NIL, whatever else. It, it certainly seems like relationships matter for K.J. Bolden. I'm not naive here. I'm obviously assuming that Georgia had a, you know, whatever's allowed through the rules and whatever. I'm, I'm sure that Georgia had a substantial NIL package for him, too. I, I'm le- certainly led to believe that's probably the case. But but beyond that, it's also like at least 20 visits, you know, for, for Bolden over the course of a period of years coming to UGA, a close tie between like say Bolden's mom and the Georgia coaches and, you know, relationships can still matter even in the kind of the transactional age of college football we have right now, 
That, to me, may be my favorite thing about the Bolden recruitment overall. How about for you? What was your overall take on Georgia swooping in and getting this gigantic win uh, on Wednesday? Yeah, well, one, great player, always grateful to add such talented guys. Two, the Buford curse, which we've heard so much about, is is broken or so, seemingly so. Three, we got a positive flip in, you know, on the heels of Rayola signing with Nebraska. So mm. there's a lot of just acute wins just in that space. But I think it's also worth noting that, you know, for Georgia – one, these kids aren't poor. I mean, this is we, we've got a collective that does a great job of making sure there's NIL accessibility for our entire roster. And like it or not, you don't need to like it. We've, we've had that conversation here before is that's the way business is done in college athletics, but specifically in college football these days. And when you're looking at, you know, let's call it a payroll of 400 plus thousand dollars per month for the majority of your roster, and that excludes some of your high-level players, you know, these players aren't poor. They're not broke. It's not like Georgia's not competing in that NIL space. With that said, we've heard, and I'm not in the know, but I know people who are, who've said on multiple accounts and, and would echo this sentiment that Georgia has gotten players on discount from what they could have gotten in other places. And I think K.J. Bolden is a great example of that. You read the quotes that he had from signing day, and he left money on the table to come to Georgia. Why? Because of relationships, because of opportunity, because of development, because you're competing for a national championship on an annual basis. That's what folks still value. Now it's got to be all in perspective. Again, you, you go back a few weeks to when you and I talking and saying, it's tough for an 18-year-old kid. Heck, it's tough, tough for anybody to say, I'm walking away from six, seven-figure deals that you know could be life-changing for me and my family. For someone who's never made a single dollar, as most of these kids have not, you're going, that's a significant amount of money. It is. But when you have that big picture involved and, and you look at it and you say, the experience matters, the relationship matters, the locker room matters, and the opportunity to win, which has been proven at the University of Georgia, those all balance that equation a little bit for players that have that big picture perspective. I want to be respectful of your time here, John. Before we wrap up, what else did you like about the 2024 class? I'm assuming you may mention the fact they brought in these Redwood Tree offensive linemen. I'm assuming that probably got your attention, but I don't want to presume too much here. What else did you like about this 2024 class for Georgia? Yeah, well, let's start up front, right? I mean, the, the number one thing that if, if you look at the transfer portal, there have been wide receivers, there have been running backs that are available. Very rarely have you seen these big offensive linemen, and I think there are a few exceptions on the D-line, but generally speaking, when you talk about the trenches, and Coach Smart talked about this on signing day, of that's a position, both are position groups that demand a little more development. And you're talking about guys that – you get to come in and, and be a part of your culture and your process and uh, mainstays of the identity of the program. So uh, you look at the, the big dogs that they brought in, and it's a quite a haul. In addition to that, the number ones across the board and position groups and really the top three. I mean, uh, I'm excited about seeing what Frazier brings to that running back room. It's been, you know, one of the staples that this Georgia team has had is featuring running backs that are truly exceptional and uh you're i'm excited about all those players but again it's it's the the big dogs in the middle uh both offensive and defensive locally it's going to be exciting to see what they can do at this next level all right two quick things i want to let you go thing number one is this you know you mentioned the offensive lineman and a point that i made a few times is is that we've got a little bit of a track record starting to form for the transfer portal. It's a sample size that sort of tells us what it is and tells us what it isn't. And a quarterback can transfer like Caleb Williams and go win a Heisman Trophy at USC. A Keon Coleman at wide receiver can transfer to Florida State and be one of the best players in the country here this year. There are a good number of positions that seem like the transfer portal is a pretty good option for in terms of getting better. You don't see great offensive linemen transferring. I don't fully understand necessarily why that is, but you just don't really see that. Georgia in particular has been very good at keeping good offensive linemen in the program. You know, guys like Dylan Fairchild and Micah Morris are perhaps waiting in the wings for more playing time in 2024. They started to get some of that here this year. Maybe there's more of that on the way. 
Georgia seems to have good offensive linemen waiting the wings. And this 2024 class kind of populates the next generation of that. And so to me, I think that's really interesting that of all the things that kind of separates Georgia from its competition, I don't just mean SEC teams. I mean, Ohio State desperately wanted better offensive linemen this year, could not find it in the transfer portal. It seems like this 24 portal is going to be a similar story for teams that feel like they need it. The ability to have good offensive linemen waiting in the wings truly may be one of the true separators because there is no quick fix easy button for whatever reason at that position. Yeah, and I think it starts with the demands of the position. Let's let's go back to the days of Maurice Claret and Mike Williams. Maurice Claret at Ohio State, Mike Williams at USC. They come out of high school and they're ready. I mean, those guys, they were the ones who were the first to kind of challenge, why can't we just make that jump to the NFL, right? I mean, just super talented, one running back, one wide receiver. And what we've seen is there are capable skill position players that come in game ready right out of high school. You know, maybe it's certain packages and those types of things. What you see very rarely is offensive linemen that are ready for that level of physical play because they need those couple of years to develop, to get stronger, to understand that not only will you face speed, but you're going to face speed with power. And that takes time. And what we've what we've been able to do at Georgia, what they've recognized is we can cultivate our own. Let's start with these four and five star guys, bring them in, let them understand. And most offensive linemen do. It's not, we're not slighting you that you don't get an opportunity to start day one. It gives you time to prepare for when you are ready, that then you can show the world the talents that you have. For a lot of these programs, if you start too early, and I think we've seen this in yesteryear at Georgia, that because of necessity, we had young, young offensive linemen that played, that I think it probably stunted their development. And you know, that very rarely can you, you're talking national championship competing teams. Can you come in and see the, the country's best at this level? Who wanted to see Will Anderson last year as a, as a true freshman? Nobody. You know, there is, there is. Did I lose John? Is that, is that on John or is that on my end? Good conversation going there. John, you got me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. I, was, I don't know if that was on me or on you, but the last little part of your answer, uh, we kind of lost there. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of – It was long-winded, B.A. Nope. I mean, you know, just rambling on. Don't worry about no, it. No problem. Hey, last thing for you real quick because a lot of people are talking about this. It seems like even though we're moving into Christmas and, and George is obviously going to be in Miami in a couple of days, there's also a little bit of an on-guard status here related to a couple pieces of news that come out. I still think that uh, smart people think that Trevor Etienne could be in play for Georgia, the former Florida running back. Colby Young is a name that's kind of popped up here as of late, the former Miami wide receiver. Xavier McLeod, the South Carolina defensive lineman. I think that's still a name that we could hear around Georgia. I'm not asking you to break down the game film on these players necessarily, yeah. but just because sort of a broad pick, big picture standpoint that we saw London Humphreys in the fold that had been kind of expected to happen for quite some time. And I think that the – the the sort of you know ear to the ground type scenario here says that a Colby Young, a McLeod, a, a, a Trevor Etienne, these are all very real possibilities that perhaps could come sooner rather than later. Yeah, and I, I think Georgia has proven that they are more selective on who they bring in through the transfer portal. I mean, it's you look at the Colorados and the USC's that take in you know half their roster, a quarter of their roster on an annual basis. That's not going to be Georgia's makeup ever. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, there's going to be more attrition than addition just because of the way that Georgia has set up their program. There's going to be, they try to recruit really well in high school and get guys developed and keep them here and in-house and provide opportunities as they're earned. With that said, there's certain players and certain position groups that you look at and you go, man, a, a, a proven commodity could really help here. A guy like Trevor Etienne, who would turn him away? That's like a Jameer Gibbs a few years ago where, you know, he's leaving Georgia Tech and anybody who is the recipient of his services for a few months is going to be very grateful. So there's talent that exceeds, you know, the overall approach that you say any team would be grateful to have them. With that said, I think defensive line, uh, depth at wide receiver or cornerback, if you can bring in a, a really – 
super talented running back. You take those opportunities, but they're pretty judicious with who they who they bring in and the the particular players that they've you know looked at and said I think they can help more than what we've already got in house or what we can add through signing day. John, I really appreciate your time today. It's so fun to do this on a Friday here. Hope you and your family are getting ready for a great Christmas. Obviously, a lot of excitement around what may happen for Georgia in Miami next week and the chance to start laying that groundwork for what I think is going to be a very entertaining 2024 for these dogs there as well. So we appreciate you bringing the festive attire to the program today, but also adding to our holiday cheer with some very, very interesting conversations around UGA. So, John, enjoy the time here over the course of the next few days, and we will look forward to getting the chance to talk to you again soon. Thank you, B.A., and to you and all of Dog Nation, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Hope you have a great Merry day. Christmas indeed, John. Appreciate that. Happy Holidays to everyone. Thank you very, very much. So good stuff from John Stinchcomb there. A little bit of a different kind of show for us here today. Let me do a little bit of housekeeping here, and then we're going to kind of move right into taking a few comments. To our podcast audience, we're going to get ready to say goodbye to you here in a minute, and just know that you're going to get a podcast show popping into your feed for the 26th, the 27th, it's Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. No show for us on Christmas, but a couple of shows next week leading into our live uh, broadcast from Miami, which for us, for Dog Nation Daily, will begin on Thursday. So we're going to get ready to say goodbye to all of you and say Merry Christmas there as well. And uh, just appreciate you being a part of the podcast here on a regular basis. We're going to do some comment stuff um, with our uh, video folks here there too in a moment, but to our podcast people, we certainly appreciate you always being here and being a part of this. And uh, just know, uh, that we've got shows coming for you next week. And we just appreciate you uh, being here and being a part of this and Merry Christmas to all of you. Now to those on video, we'll also take some of your comments here as kind of a RS Andrews cool down and a dog nation daily presented by Kroger sort of get combined into a one thing here for a moment. And we'll sort of do this, you know, kind of related to uh, to a few things, right? Uh, the Florida State stuff is ongoing. Some of you may even be watching that as we're doing this here. I guess the one big question I would have as it relates to that is, okay, so if it's going to take hundreds of millions of dollars, whatever that number ends up being, to kind of buy your way out of the ACC, like who provides that money? Because here's what we're all smart enough to understand. Wh whoever signs your paychecks is your boss. This is the problem that kind of exists in the NIL era is that, the coach is supposed to be the boss of the team, so to speak. But if someone else is the one that's funding the players, well, technically speaking, it's the, the, the person that signs the paycheck is the boss. And so if Florida State has to like acquiesce to some capital investment company, you know, uh, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars to get out of the ACC, well, now Florida State has a boss. You know, Florida State's not free to make its own choice at that point in time. Uh, it will have, you know, to, to sort of bend the knee to its benefactor. And so that's one of the things that will be a very different world for college athletics, if that is indeed the case. And we'll kind of follow that. And as it relates to Georgia in particular for what's going to happen at the Orange Bowl, you know, there next week. Uh, and then in addition to that, the aftermath of the signing day stuff, you want to continue that conversation. We're able to do that. Or if you uh, want to talk about some of the stuff that might happen in the transfer portal, all I can tell you is when it comes to the names that have been most prominently mentioned, Etienne, uh, I guess now the Miami wide receiver, Colby Young, uh, Xavier McLeod. I have every reason to believe that those guys are still very much in play for Georgia and perhaps it could come sooner rather than later. Now, exactly when that is, I'm not quite so sure. Uh, the closer it gets to Christmas, the more you may have to hear from me about that at some point in time next week. I am not breaking in to do a live show on Christmas Eve if one of these guys were to uh, make it you know, official to Georgia, although I would certainly be happy to have them here and, and, and doing that. But we are on guard moving into Christmas that Georgia could get some good news around that here at some point in time. Uh, but as far as when it might be the case, not quite so sure, but no one has kind of quieted down the idea that, um, that, that George could very much be in play for those guys. The other thing we're going to watch for, and we'll obviously talk more about this, um, with, with our commenters here in just a moment too, is, is who may or may not be opted out for the, um, for the bowl game for Georgia that we have not heard from the, like the really large numbers of opt-outs the way that, um, uh, the way that Florida State has, but that doesn't mean that Georgia won't have some. If I had to guess, either a very limited version of Brock Bowers, perhaps no Brock Bowers at all. He, after all, was pretty banged up in the uh, SEC championship game. So, you know, that's a guy you may wonder if you see it all or perhaps you see in a very limited capacity. I know there's like these faint internet rumors. Well, maybe Brock Bowers will come back for senior year. I truly believe the chance of that happening are roughly 0%. I'm not trying to be like callous or, you know, 
whatever. I just Brock Bowers going to be like a top five, top ten pick. Of course, he's leaving and moving on to the NFL. I believe he'd be kind of crazy not to. So, I mean, and I have loved Brock Bowers. And I'd love nothing more to see more football from him. But I think the writing's pretty clearly on the wall for this based on his draft status and also based on the fact that he has had a lingering injury. My guess is we either see very little of or no Brock Bowers at all. I know that um, Mark Weiser from the Athens Banner Herald is going to put it out on uh, X here over the course of the uh, last day or so that Bowers is not one of the guys that's slated to be one of the Georgia press conference attendees next week, and neither is Javon Bullard. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it is kind of a data point of who might or might not be opting out. You know, guys like uh, Sarah Ron Parker Ager and others are participating in these events. So, there will be some opt-outs for Georgia. Georgia's not always the most forthcoming about some of this kind of stuff. Remember, they don't you, – you only take 70 guys on the road for away games. And, uh, uh, you know, Georgia doesn't release travel roster. You know, a lot of the uh, reporters will have to go through there and kind of identify who's working out pregame to sort of figure out who there, who is there and who isn't. That's just Georgia's prerogative to keep that a secret. Oftentimes, that's what they choose to do. So the overall bowl roster, they may try to – you know, keep that as secretive as they possibly can there as well. So some of the who's playing and who's not stuff may truly not be fully known until game time, if that makes sense. So that's kind of the stuff that's out there. We'll take a few comments. I'm going to have the dognation.com comment section on the phone here. Everybody else will see here on the laptop. We'll just sort of roll through some of these. Scott Pete says, Merry Christmas to BA. And I say, Scott, right back to you. Merry Christmas there as well. Love this Christmas time of year. Uh, Looking forward to that. You know, after today, I'm going to kind of unplug here for a little bit and try to enjoy that time with my family and sort of get my mind right around what Christmas is supposed to be all about. And so we're going to do that, but really excited about coming back next week uh, with a lot of coverage of Georgia and the Orange Bowl. I, I, one of the things you're going to hear me say in one of our shows that we're doing next week is, is that I've actually kind of gotten pretty excited about the Orange Bowl. And, I, you know, I don't really care what, you know, Florida State has or doesn't have going on. I'm just looking forward to seeing my team play. And uh, next Saturday will be a chance to do that. Barry Watkins also gives us a Merry Christmas, which I certainly appreciate. Um, Taylor Russell says, I thought we were your family, B.A. Well, you were certainly uh, uh, my family away from my family. I think of you all as my second family, to be sure. Um, D.T. says, my wife wishes I'd do some housekeeping. See, uh, you that's what you think, D.T., that she wishes I would do some housekeeping. But the thing you understand is, is that my strategy is to do things like that so terribly, so badly, that I am not ever asked to do it again. See, if you set the expectations low enough, A, when you do anything positive, it's like oh, this huge win, so you get you get credit for what would otherwise be a fairly meager performance. But also, if you just do things poorly enough, no one ever asks you to do those again, which is uh, uh, kind of my sort of strategy when it comes to housework and things like that. Uh, let's see what else. Lucy Bowers Borkin says, I still like the – uh, bowl games, but she says that she thinks there are too many. You see, I, I'm not in the way too many bowl games crowd. I I, enjoy, I think there's only one game today. I wish there were more. You know, um, I just kind of like the like last night was crazy, right? It's like South Florida is throttling a Syracuse team that's you know kind of the last game before Fran Brown becomes head coach, and they had one point time like a tight end and a quarterback. It's just like ugly mess. But I guess I'm just a college football obsessive because even that's kind of fun and entertaining to me. I just sort of like all that stuff. Um, I just sort of like all that stuff. Eric DeVorns, he says that, uh, he says his wife basically has to do everything for him because he's so bad at it. Yeah. Look, I, I like to think that a lot of us who are guys, you know, we're so focused on like, you know, getting you know, the job done and taking care of the things we're supposed to take care of that maybe sometimes we're not as good at taking care of some of the other stuff, but, uh, maybe that's not the case. Scott Pete says he watched Matthew Stafford last night. I didn't see a ton of that. I did see that one. Th- I saw two things from Stafford this week. The one throw he made last night was like something out of the uh, Matrix or something, where he did the sidearm and that ball just had the. It's, it's hard to describe exactly what this was, but it was this sort of sidearm flick release thing, which was, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable, unbelievable, just unbelievable touch and throw and just ability to kind of get generate arm strength out of just nothing more than like a flick of a wrist from Stafford. And also, and we'll do this with Jake at some point in time. Uh, but the very funny moment with Jake Fromm and Matthew Stafford, just really, really funny stuff. Has uh, Jake came up and had some nice words for Matthew Stafford, and Matthew Stafford then turned to was it was it Gardner Minshew that he was talking to or whoever that was, saying that uh, um, that Jake Fromm had given him the old man treatment, which I thought was really funny, uh, uh for sure. Jacob O'Neill saw that too. That's good to know. Comments continue to uh, roll in uh, here. 
Lance D says that Stafford's getting hot at the right time for the Rams. He's still a top tier quarterback and all time arm. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I mean, I, I know we all now, and I understand why we do, but we all now have this love for like the, you know, for lack of a better phrase, the sort of dual threat quarterback. But there is still something to be said for guys who can just sling it. I mean, there is still a lot of efficiency in a guy that can just rip it. And Stafford can rip it. And, you know, I'm not a scout. I, I don't know who has had the strongest arm of all the Georgia quarterbacks. But I remember the very first time I saw Stafford throw, the way that thing just pierced the air when he threw it. I, I don't know that I've seen somebody that throws it just more, you know, just with greater velocity, just greater, just, ugh. I mean, he just really brings it to the uh, table. Uh, um, uh, you love to see that. Uh, Rick Martin uh, on the subject of the basketball team. Yeah, one of the things that I'm, I'm very proud to see is the way which looks like Mike White's got some good things going there um, for Georgia basketball. And obviously, we're kind of a football show because it's what our audience wants. But as a personal fan, I love all the Georgia teams. And I'd love nothing more than to see uh, great success for the Georgia basketball team. Maybe Mike White's capable of bringing that. Um, Jacob O'Neill also sends some Merry Christmas wishes. Appreciate that. Uh, James Katie Young says, my son and I met you after the South Carolina game, right as you came up the stairs to the bookstore. Thanks for being so kind to take a picture with him. It made his day. That's awesome. I actually remember that. That was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, James, I appreciate that. We did uh, have a, a really good time on that. And my favorite thing about game day is that chance to meet people, say hello to people and talk to them. Uh, I just am really, really thankful for that because like the one thing that you learn when you do a show like this, talking to a lot of Georgia fans, it's like Georgia fans are it's just a good group of people. Like, it's a really fun thing to be a part of. And, gosh, I mean, I can't imagine what my life would be like if I didn't have – now, I also happen to work around this. But even before I did this job, I still – you know, Georgia football is my favorite pastime. Spending time around Georgia fans my favorite thing to do. And it's just like when you get a chance to meet as many of them as I get a chance to meet, including the Youngs, uh, the Young family and uh, their terrific uh, uh, son – when you get a chance to do stuff like that, you just realize that it's, boy, it's just a great group of people who make up Dog Nation. Really, really good stuff. Taylor Russell, thanks for the kind words. Daniel, appreciate the uh, uh, Merry Christmas wishes. Appreciate that. Kyle Bowie asking about uh, Stetson Bennett. I talked to some people, you know, a little bit closer to, to Bennett. Seems like he's doing pretty well. Um, you know, seems like, uh, you know, he's obviously enjoying his time, I think, back home again, which is a nice thing to see. We all saw him the old Miss game, I guess, when he was presented with the Brolsworth or not, or honored as the uh, uh, Brolsworth Trophy winner. So it seems like that he's on his, you know, way to uh, to a good situation here. We continue to pray for him and wish him well on all of that. Kathy Aquaviva checking in here. She says Georgia football is truly one of my greatest happy places. It really is indeed the case. And Kathy, it's even better when people pronounce your last name right, right? Uh, as I have now taken to be able to do. Uh, Craig Jones checks in to say, have a great Christmas and bring home a W next weekend. Hope we're prepared and put out an exclamation point against Florida State. And I think a lot of Georgia fans kind of hoping for the same thing there on all of that. Whether Florida State has a full roster or an empty roster or anything in between, you know, seeing Georgia go out and have a great performance is definitely something people want to see. Andrew Sisson over here at DogNation.com also wishing Merry Christmas to the Dog Nation team. We appreciate that. Uh, K Dog says, since since Beck is coming back, where are we with Malik Murphy? You know he wants to play and be quarterback number one. So I think some of this you end up kind of reading tea leaves on a little bit. And we heard reports that said Georgia had reached out to Murphy, but since then, which for some reason this time of year makes me think of uh, Kevin McAllister when he calls the police. My name's Murphy. Uh, I don't know why that popped in my mind, but. Um, when uh, uh, when we heard those reports that that George had reached out to Murphy in the immediate aftermath of that, we started hearing about these uh, like visits, like I don't want to say it's an official visit, but like official reports of visits that Murphy was going to take, and George was not one of those. So I think that leads you to believe that the Murphy thing was perhaps more about the back stuff than not not getting Dylan Riola just on the basis of those visit plans that took place after that i think you sort of start to piece that together which would mean that kirby smart talked last or on wednesday about georgia not being at like full quota on quarterbacks that they want four scholarship quarterbacks right now they only have three so would georgia like to get another scholarship quarterback sounds like they would but i don't believe that's at the malik murphy level it's probably at a different level than that someone 
because I'll just say this real quick. I am very much a believer that Gunner Stockton could be a terrific backup quarterback for Georgia next season, a guy that you're very happy to have as an understudy to Carson Beck. And this could just sort of be Beck, I should say, Gunner's show 2025 and beyond. Now, that doesn't mean that Georgia won't do everything it can to make itself as good as it possibly can be at the quarterback position, developing Ryan Puglisi too, uh, much the same way that gunner has been developing in kind of a third-string role here right now, and also looking to bring in quarterback talent when it possibly can. So – Malik Murphy was a dude that, if you want to go back to spring practice, he earned a lot of buzz. There was a little bit of a thought that that Murphy uh, could have been a pretty attractive tar- target in the transfer portal had he left during spring. He beat out Arch Manning for the backup job there at Texas, and obviously Murphy got a chance to start a couple of games for Texas here this year. So his ultimate landing spot may be more as like the guy somewhere else, where obviously in Georgia right now, that wouldn't be the case. And so – what level of quarterback does that mean that George is going to go out and get? I guess I couldn't know. The good news is there's no shortage of options because there's a hundred and something quarterbacks in the transfer portal here right now, but it's probably one of those that's a little bit further down the pecking order than what you would kind of think of Malik Murphy being. Um, Ken Holcomb says, I want to read this comment. He says, this is insane. Arch Manning made $3.2 million this year as a backup quarterback at Texas. Brock Purdy, the NFL so there was a tweet that's out there. What Kent's referencing is somebody, and I believe it was like a producer for like Pardon the Interruption, tweeted that Arch Manning made $3.2 million, which is more than like Brock Purdy made for the San Francisco 49ers. Here is something very important to understand. I believe that statement that the person made about what Arch Manning so-called made is based on the NIL valuation that Arch Manning has from on three. Anybody who's ever tried to sell their home for what it lists for on Zillow understands that you can't always look at those like online valuations of things and know what's what. That is a theoretical idea. Nobody in the world knows how much Arch Manning is making in NIL. Nobody does. There is a theoretical valuation of what his name, image, likeness is supposedly worth, and that's what uh, On3 does. Listen, I have a lot of friends that work for On3. I don't, I, don't, I don't have a bad thing to say about On3, but they are not incentivized to make these numbers look small. A, it would potentially hurt their you know, relationship with the big-name you know, athletes, but also B, it's just more interesting to see big numbers. So I'm not telling you that Arch Manning's not making $100 million or making you know $900,000 or anything in between. But nobody knows how much Arch Manning is truly making in NIL. This, you know, rando that tweeted this, that did get some sort of retweets and a lot of attention. um, He was basing that on an, I believe, an on three NIL evaluation that perhaps doesn't have very much in the uh, connection to reality. Obviously, Arch Manning's got a lot of NIL value, but how much that actually is, we don't know. Because it seems like there's sort of two things that go on with NIL. You got some people are like, oh, he doesn't care about NIL at all. Well, that always seems to be a little bit, you know, probably exaggerated. You know, have, have a hard time believing that any athlete doesn't care about it at all. Got to turn down the chance to get, you know, large sum of money if it came their way. But on the flip side of that, there's also the other extreme, which is that everybody's getting $100 million or whatever figure you've heard, heard thrown out there. And, you know, I would just say when it comes to NIL, be very, very careful what you take at face value because of how many people just sort of run with like the most specious claims possible. So I'm glad that Kent brought that up because that's been out there. And it's just sort of an example of how things just kind of get into the culture here pretty quick without a lot of, you know, absolute, I guess, understanding of it all. Kathy says, I heard about 1.2 million on Arch a little earlier this season. Who really knows? I did see the old Miss commit showing up on signing day in a black Lambo. Yeah, I saw that too. And here's the other thing too. It's like, if I were to give you a lease on a Honda Accord, or if I were to give you a lease on like a Lamborghini Countach or something like that, whatever cool car that exists now, if I were to give you a lease on either of those two cars, your your actual net worth stays the same no matter which car I give you. Does that make sense? We understand this that if it's a lease on an automobile, it doesn't matter if it's a lease on a $25,000 car or a $250,000 car, your net worth remains unchanged because this is a lease. A lease is not something that someone's giving you. It's a thing that you are giving to somebody else. You know, most people would be paying for that. So this is the other thing to sort of keep in mind 
one of the great signs of wealth when it comes to the NIL age is, oh, look at this car that so-and-so is driving or look at this apartment. Remember, remember Bear Alexander's apartment out in L.A.? Once again, I could give you an apartment lease for a year in L.A., but your net worth is not changing on the basis of that because you don't own that. I've always said, like, if you really want to cash in from the NIL standpoint, when somebody comes up to you and offers you like some sort of Ferrari lease or something like that, tell them, actually, give me some raw forest land, because at least that's worth something. That doesn't look cool on Instagram, but at least it's worth something. And that's one of those important things to keep in mind that some of the signs of wealth, the trappings of wealth that, you know, when a player shows up to a press conference driving a Ferrari, there's a very good chance he rented that. I mean, when Florida had the Ferraris out there in the field for their photo shoots, they didn't buy the Ferrari. They just rented it to come sit out there and look good in the photo. So, you know, the trappings of wealth are oftentimes going to be used to sort of pitch the hysteria that exists around the NIL stuff. And clearly money is a factor in recruiting now. Perhaps it always has been, but it certainly is now. And in some cases, it's high dollar recruiting. We're not denying that being the case, but most of the athletes who are really getting a lot of money aren't talking about it at all. And the more, you know, so-and-so says, I've been offered a million dollars by seven different schools. The more that you're left to conclude, well, that what that really means is you're hoping that somebody will now offer you a million dollars because of all the, the, the chatter you're trying to generate. So I think that's, um, uh, um, uh, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind there. <laughs> Frank Patterson says, <laughs> I also, as Frankie says, he's a crypto guy, which does not surprise me at all about Frankie. But he says, uh, I need to make sure I put, this is not financial advice at the end of every one of these conversations. That's exactly right. This is for entertainment purposes only. Seek out your own financial uh, advice from other people. Um, Scott Pete taking it back to the old days with some of the stuff that went on there. Uh, uh, Dusty Waddell says, have you heard anything about Marcus Roseme Jackson? I have not, but that's one of those guys I'd, I'd love to have him come back. I was thrilled when he came back a year ago. And, you know, we're in kind of a weird time in college football where basically everybody can come back. Uh, and so if Rosemary Jackson could come back, I'd love for him to. But uh, obviously we also understand that some guys are sort of ready for the next phase and, you know, trying their hand at the NFL or something like that. Um, let's see what else. Uh, K-Dog says, uh, who would be that stupid to pay an 18-year-old kid that kind of money to not be producing? The business world would laugh that into scorn. Yeah, this is why this is why you're not really seeing a lot of like major companies get involved in NIL is because they literally just can't. I mean, they, they just can't. Because, I mean, these are companies that have like corporate charters and things like that. They have shareholders. And you've got to be able to sort of validate the expected return on investment. In most cases, you know, most athletes won't do that. Now, we did just see... Uh, as an example of what NIL was originally sort of supposed to be, like Carson Beck just signed a deal with one of the credit unions. And, you know, I, that, that, that's a credit union that spends money in advertising. They have a legitimate advertising budget. They view Beck as a legitimate, you know, endorser that can bring them more business. Uh, I'm guessing they're paying him a very good fee for doing that. I think that Beck probably deserves it. I believe that Beck's probably a really good spokesman. Like, that's an example of, well, of course, this makes some sense. You know, a company that has legitimate advertising budget, you know, putting big dollars behind a Georgia quarterback coming back for his final year. Uh, even if you're a you know pretty staunch traditionalist, that sort of feels like no harm, no foul, right? Quarterback for a company like this, you know, why not let him do that? It's, you know, why would you, you know, work to restrict something like that? It just sort of makes all the sense in the world. But even that, it's not $3 million. Like, I mean... It's somebody who knows a little something about advertising budgets. Uh, you know, you know, <laughs> there are ceilings on some of this kind of stuff, even for a guy like Carson Beck, you would think, at least in the in, on the on the basis of this particular deal, you would imagine. Um uh, let's see what else. BA's Ty Stone Cold Style says the college football's got a chest bigger than anyone knows. The money in cars or peas in the cotton field. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot of money. There is, but I, the thing that I've always kind of, you know, thought about the NIL agents we're living in is that the incentives are so different now than they used to be. You know, it's like if I was like Monopoly Man Rich in the old days, school came to me and said, oh, we got to have you do this. Like I'd get my name on something like walk around Sanford Stadium a little bit. You know, there are people's names on things. 
go to the campus at large. There's all kinds of people's names on those things. And just because they've been there for a really long time, in some cases more than a century, doesn't mean the names that are on there aren't still just as important to the families as they ever were. You know, that used to be the old system, right? Is like, hey, you know, you give to Big State you, and they'll put your name on something. And that's, I mean, that matters to people. You've heard the old phrase about everybody dies twice. You die when you die, and then you die when people say your name for the last time. You know, that's kind of a way to sort of prevent that so-called second death, is that my name lives on forever. That's re If you've got all the money in the world, that's what you start looking to do is sort of figure out how can I keep my name lasting longer than just my time here on the earth. That becomes a very important thing. And that's what sort of giving to colleges and giving to athletic programs has oftentimes, you know, provided. But the NIL age doesn't really, you know, doesn't really provide that. If I'm the Monopoly man, if I've got all the money in the world, it's not like Carson Beck's going to wear my name on the back of his jersey. So it's like, you know, what do I get for that? Or even like the smaller, you know, like what we think of as sort of like regular rich people, not like crazy rich people, but sort of like regular rich people. You know, when they give to like the West End Zone project or the new football building, like they get enhanced opportunity to buy tickets or they get a chance to come out and hang out with the Georgia coaches after signing day or something like that. You know, once again, up until now, I don't believe we've properly incentivized the NIL world to reflect that even for the people giving more like sort of the five figure sums of money, even that, you know, doesn't quite get incentivized in the NIL space the same way that the incentives existed in the more traditional space. And figuring out what to do about something like that is probably, um, you know, pretty important. Uh, Mark Woodman C says, what's your honest assessment of Evan Stewart or Colby Young? So in the case of Evan Stewart, I mean, obviously, I'd love for George to be a fact with Stewart. I don't have anything to give you on that. I, You know, that's not something that I have, you know, much in the way of uh, 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 I, I just don't have anything of substance to tell you about Evan Stewart other than the fact that that'd be awesome to see George get involved with a guy like that. But other Texas A&M players that we would think perhaps would command a high dollar and would perhaps be motivated – to get as much as they can get. We never heard word one about George and Walter Nolan. We never heard word one about George and LT Overton. I'm assuming, and maybe my assumption will end up being wrong, but I'm assuming that the same thing that's true with Evan Stewart. We never really ever hear anything of substance about George and Evan Stewart because that's just kind of the way that goes. Um, uh, now, in the case of Colby Young, I'm always in favor of power five wide receivers who've gotten some production at a pretty big place. I think a guy like Young, if he were to come over, would come over with a little bit of an established track record. And like Miami's offense is terrible, was terrible. So there's also a chance there's a little bit of a value add for a guy like that at a place like Georgia because Georgia's offense just functions so much better. Um, it's one of the reasons why I think it's weird that we were hearing those you know rumors about Cam Ward going to Miami uh, because you know when you see the way in which uh, uh, Mario Castrobal – you know, I mean, at one point in time, Van Dyke was a big time prospect. Now Van Dyke had to leave the program. And you go back and look at, uh, you know, what's his name for the Chargers, who completely, you know, sort of ruined his career there at Oregon. I mean, like Cristobal's track record with quarterbacks is terrible. So understanding that, there's a chance that Colby Young could be even better in a better functioning offense. Um Somebody mentioned down here, and I, I'm sorry, the comments come fast when we're doing the show in this format, so I don't always get to see them, about like the idea of like eligibility and things like that. This is too complicated of a topic to get into in a day like this. But I do wonder if this is not the next frontier on all of this. Whereas like people are always like coming after college football because it supposedly restricts this and restricts that. But the NFL won't allow these players to come in until they're three years removed from high school. Like at some point in time, why doesn't the NFL ever get challenged on that? The way the college gets challenged on every one of its longstanding rules and uh, you know, practices, you know, college football is always fighting this stuff in court. How come the NFL always gets away from this for free? Because I've always sort of felt like that, that the NFL gets so much from college football without having to contribute to any of it. You know, a player that moves on to the NFL from college football kind of steps in with like a ready made, we use the phrase name, image, and likeness. There's value attached to these rookies in the NFL, their name, image, and likeness because of the way in which college football does such a great job of promoting them as stars. The NFL gets that for free. doesn't have to pay anything for that. And I've always sort of felt like that, that college football ought to try to shift that conversation of, hey, if these future NFL players need to get paid, maybe the NFL ought to be paying them. 
I mean, because the NFL benefits from the work that college football does to market them. And in a, in a place like Atlanta and a state like Georgia and most parts of the South, college football actually markets young football players better than the NFL ever could. That the reason why the draft is such a big deal is because those of us who love college football watch it and those who love the NFL watch it. And the guys that get drafted are already famous because of how we respond to great college football stars. The NFL gets all that for free and and then gets turned around and say, you can't come into our league until after you've been pumped up by college football for three years. And then we've had, you know, all this time to evaluate you and scout you and the college football programs have had all this time to hype you up. And so therefore you're, you know, you have maximum value to us now. So we'll let you come into the league. Um, with all of the change that's in the air, I wonder if the eligibility requirements at some point in time get pushed about, well, if I want to go straight to the NFL, how come I can't? Or the flip side of that, if I want to stay in college ball for eight years, how come I can't? I mean, this is some of y'all who are a little older. This used to be a thing, right? Uh, old days of like, say, service academies and things like that. Uh, you know, perhaps a little bit more now with some of the LDS players, uh, not eight years, but you know what I'm saying? Like guys who are older than a traditional college player, but in the old days, for sure, you know, the, uh, um, uh, the idea that you would serve your country and then come back and play college ball, that's more of a real thing, right? And so maybe in some future year, you've got some of the, the really big time prospects who say, I want to go right to the NFL. And you've got other guys who say, I don't ever want to leave college. I want to be here forever. And you kind of wonder, well, if nothing can be restricted, then how could that be restricted? I, I think I think you'd be left to wonder that a little bit. Or, and this is the big one, and I just don't know how people are going to respond to this. Like at some point in time, are these athletes, some athletes, going to challenge the idea of how come I have to go to school? If if I'm an employee, you know, for all intents and purposes, how come you're making me go to class? And how can I be restricted on where I can bet? Because one of the things we don't really hear a lot about publicly, but behind the scenes is a pretty big deal. You know, academics doesn't seem to factor very much into the conversation overall, but in the transfer portal, it does. There are a lot of guys who don't transfer because they can't get into the school they're going to. Uh, it's easier to sort of stay in your current school, but your transcript just gets evaluated differently when you're trying to transfer to a new school. And so sometimes when you wonder, well, how come so-and-so didn't transfer? Sometimes across all of college football, that's about not being able to get into the school you want to go to or perhaps being able to get into any school. At some point in time, does that get challenged? If everything is up for challenge, if the NCAA seemingly is – you know, too feckless to be able to enforce any of its rules anymore, then how do you sort of enforce those basic rules that have kind of defined what college football is? And if it's no longer any of this stuff, well, is it still the same sport that we love? Like, I'm, I'm not fatalistic and I'm, you know, generally speaking, I have a joyful attitude about life, but I do think there are some real tough, hard questions coming for college athletics. I really, really do. And, um, I, you know, having people take a sort of a serious look at some of this kind of stuff I don't think that makes you, um, I don't know, you know, sort of, you know, too old fashioned to kind of have some sort of thought of, okay, how do you actually construct a newer version of the sport without it being something completely different? Because if it's completely different, the odds are it won't be quite as popular. And I just think, I just think that's probably true. Um, uh, Rick Martin asking about Justin Fields. See, I'd love for the Falcons to get Fields. Um, the issue I have with the Falcons right now is they're just too boring. Um, and at the very least, you know, have a local product playing quarterback would make them less boring. I, I think that would, I, I'm sort of, I would be very pro Justin Fields in, uh, Atlanta. I would, all right, we're going to do a few more comments. We're going to wrap it up here. And then I'll give you another reminder about how the uh, Christmas season is going to play out here. Uh, Tom on DogNation.com, on the subject of Bama having three cupcake games. Do they have three? Cause I do know. In addition to, I mean, part of the reason why that is because the SEC kept the eight-game conference late. Part of that. But they do go on the road to Wisconsin, so I guess they at least have one sort of, uh, you know, significant non-conference game. Isha Murphy says, I think the NFL does it for medical reasons. They would prefer them to be a certain age because of the violent nature of the sport. That's true. Isha, you're probably right about that. I know your football background helps you, you know, you know with opinions such as those. But I'd also add this, is that it's a lot easier – to know how good of a football player is when he's 20 as opposed to when he's 18. I mean, look, anybody who does talent evaluations will tell you, you know, the older you are moving towards your athletic prime, the easier it is to determine 
you know, what your full true athletic potential is. It's just a little bit riskier when you're younger. And so some of the restriction of when you can join the NFL just kind of comes down to it's easier to scout a guy when you see three years of him in college. When you don't have, I mean, look at the baseball draft where like you've had a lot of guys taken straight out of high school. And that's basically a crapshoot of, of, of who's going to become what. Baseball sort of tolerates it. Um, but but when you're when you're making professional decisions based on very young athletes, that is not a a, a recipe for for you know success. Oftentimes, uh, Kathy said she had a kid in her neighborhood signed with uh, Wisconsin. That's really cool. I mean, listen, anytime you have a chance to go play major college football, you've achieved something that most people can only dream of for sure. Uh, Aaron Dixon says, "Just say no to Arthur Smith." Yeah, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. And I know the Falcons have had a lot of failed coaches. Some of those I've liked more than others. In addition to sort of evaluating Smith as a failed coach, I just don't like him. I, I, I don't. I don't like him. I don't enjoy cheering for him. Uh, I think that there's a pomposity there that I find pretty gross. I, I'm not a fan of Arthur Smith. In addition to evaluating him as a failed coach, I also don't enjoy even trying to give him the benefit of the doubt just because I don't think he's good. Um, Jeff Ingram says I'd like to hear the real story in Jamon Dumas Johnson leaving. I mean, I, I don't know that the actual real story on that's all that different than the story as most of us kind of understand it. You know, everything sort of has. Look, there's you've heard it said before, there's like sort of two sides to every story. I mean, I do think there is a legitimate element of Georgia's got a lot of very good inside linebackers. And um, a lot of those guys are going to need to be on the field or said differently. You can't go to C.J. Allen after what you saw from him this year and said, all right, C.J., back to the bench. Thanks for your contribution. You wait on this bench for another year, and we'll get you on the field You know, when you're a junior in 2025. C.J. Allen's just too good for that. So he's got to play in some form or fashion. And if you're Jamon Dumas Johnson, because of some injuries and because of some things like that, you probably did not do as much this year as uh, you would have liked to have done in terms of, you know, proving yourself as an NFL draft scout. So knowing that Georgia's deep and crowded at your position, knowing this is a big year for you to show how good you are, then maybe seeing another option there, especially when everybody's telling you what you want to hear of, oh, we'll give you all the snaps. Georgia's not using your right, blah, 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 blah. You know how that goes. Uh, it just becomes an easy thing to do. I also think the sort of middle tier starters, guys who are not your first team All-Americans, but guys that you want to keep, and I don't think there's any mistake about this, Georgia would love to have kept Jamon Dumas Johnson, obviously would have. But your ability to keep middle-tier starter type guys is just not going to be uh, a, a given much moving forward. In other words, if you've got a pile of NIL dollars, paying whatever it takes to keep a guy like Jamon Dumas Johnson in the current landscape in which we live in, that's just not possible, I don't believe. It's the same way that the Braves let certain free agents walk and things like that. You may... Uh, you may have to let some guys walk. And so Keith Folds, I want to make this very clear. He asked, so are you saying that UGA encouraged him to transfer? No, I don't believe that at all. I do not believe that. I believe Georgia wanted Jamon Dumas Johnson. I absolutely believe that Georgia wanted Jamon Dumas Johnson. But Georgia is not in a position to, A, tell him he's the only inside linebacker playing next year, or B, paying whatever it takes to keep a guy like that. Do you understand the difference? That's my understanding on all of this, is that, of course, Georgia would want to have this great leader, this veteran presence, this very, very, very good player. Of course, Georgia would want to have him. But Georgia also wants C.J. Allen and Raylan Wilson and Justin Williams and guys like that. And so, therefore, Georgia wants him a part of a very deep position group, but not to the exclusion of these other linebackers, nor when you talk about like finite budgets and things like that, can any program just sort of afford to say, hey, you're a guy, we want to take care of you. Because that just means there's less money to go around for someone who might truly be a true difference-making player. And Jamon Dumas Johnson is very, very, very good. I don't believe he's the difference between winning a national championship or not. I just have to be completely honest about that. Um, does that does that make sense? Does that seem fair? Uh, uh, perhaps. All right, let's uh, let's do a couple of other things here real quick. And we'll get ready to wrap it up. And I'll remind you how it's going to go here for the next little bit. Senior Dog 54 says, my daughter and family are going to Miami. Had an invite, but I'm staying with the recliner. Well, there you go. Uh, my family's not going to the game. We kind of kicked around a little bit here and there about how to do it. I mean, you know, if you got a family, the one good thing about the Orange Bowl is it's probably a little easier to maybe get tickets for a game like this than it sometimes might be. 
So that is the good deal. But the travel's a little tricky, right? It's like if you're trying to bring, take a whole family down there, flying's, you know, you, you know, over the holidays, not super cheap. The drive is just forever. In 2021, we drove this because I wanted my kids to go. We so we drove to Miami. Let me tell you something. I'll never do that again. That is the and I listen. I in 2020 we drove to Fayetteville, Arkansas. I didn't mind that at all. Driving to Fayetteville was a breeze compared to driving to Miami. You think it's like one state over? How far could it be? My gosh, that peninsula stretches forever, forever. You get past Orlando on the turnpike. You go for what feels like six days. I mean, the drive to Miami is forever. And there's between, like, say, Orlando and Palm Beach, there's nothing. Nothing. Uh, che uh, Chevy two times says it's only nine hours to Miami. If you live in Atlanta, that ain't, that, there's no way that's true. If you live in Atlanta, there's no way that's true. If it was nine hours, I'd drive it standing on my head. It is not no nine hours. Um, uh, <laughs> I can do nine hours in one sitting. This is not nine hours, uh, not even close. Um, Brian Whitaker says it's a gruesome drive. Craig Jones says more like 10 to 12 hours. Yeah. By the way, there's a big difference in, to me, nine hours and 10 hours, big difference, right? Once you go to like double digit hours, it's a very different trip. It's a very different trip at that point in time, I believe. Um, DT says, when do college presidents just drop football? I really do think some of them will. And in the in the uh 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 BA <laughs> Stone Cold style says it's nine hours from Jacksonville, which is very funny. Um uh uh so in the sort of discussion of all this change for college athletics, is it good or bad? Here is like the one thing that I wish could be entered into the discussion more around the idea that hey, one of these days some of these presidents may just sort of get out of the business and things like that. Because here's got here's what you gotta understand is that the thing that drives a lot of this stuff is, you know, it's about follow the dollars, follow the dollars, follow the dollars. But college presidents and colleges themselves are already pretty rich. They're already getting tons of money, you know, things like that, that, you know, but they sort of lose that on prestige in some cases, because a lot of that kind of goes towards some of these athletic uh, departments or Colleges in a, in a non-athletic world would have more prestige compared to some of their counterparts. They lose out on that because the other schools have better athletics. So to kind of create a world in which which colleges are less connected to athletics, there are plenty of university presidents who would love that. They would love that because it kind of returns the power where they think it belongs, which is in their back pocket. That's just that's just a fact. Um, and as, as sort of like a measuring stick for how we're doing going forward, here's the one question I love to ask. What is the total number of players at the Division I level on scholarship? And let's just watch what happens to that number. If that number is going down in the future, which I believe that it will in some form or fashion, either because there are fewer college programs, fewer players on scholarship in those programs, certainly fewer players signed out of high school. Colorado signed five guys the other day. Um, there are certainly fewer players being signed out of high school right now. So if all of this change is, is supposed to be for the benefit of the players, if we're reducing the number of players, how is that to their benefit? That's the one question I'd love to have somebody ask um, for sure. But we'll see. Uh, all right. Anything else? A lot of good comments. Seems like they're rolling in here. Rick Martin says, if they do it with college football, what am I going to do with all my dog up here? Well, they're not going to do it with Georgia football. But could I see a Cal or a Stanford or some future year? Could I see them not playing college football? I absolutely could. Absolutely could. Some of these schools that have a lot of prestige away from athletics, you know, remember, Stanford gets more money on a, a regular student coming to their school than they do an athlete coming to their school anyway. So the actual enrollment spot in a place like Stanford is more valuable when a regular student takes it anyway. So um, one of those schools giving up big time athletics, I totally could see that being a thing. Absolutely. Um all right. Uh, anything else before you're ready to go? Neg Dog says it is a long drive from Georgia. Glad I live in Paul Beach County. That's a beautiful area, uh, Nate. Beautiful area. Beautiful area. Um, uh, Crow King 123 says Vanderbilt may shut down football. Yeah. So that's one of those places that what they'll probably do is they'll probably try to like limit their spending as much as they possibly can and just keep reaping those checks as long as they possibly can. I could see them doing that maybe something along those lines. 
Uh, DT says, I drove Atlanta to Miami and back at 16 years old in 1980. It's, I'm sure that was quite a drive. Uh, I'm sure that was quite a drive. All right, anything else? All right, so here's what we're going to do. Frank Patterson does bring up a good point, is that the longer you drive, the more Buckies you get to stop at. There are also more Buckies in Florida than there used to be. There's one in Daytona now. So there's more Buckies than there used to be, uh, for sure. That is the case. Uh, that is indeed the case. Um, Lance D says the latest round of realignment was not great for the sport. I sort of agree with Lance there on that. It's just the kind of thing that just sort of invited. I mean, listen, I am still very optimistic about the sport overall, because as I've talked to you about a lot this week, even when it gets really weird, it sort of stays entertaining. And I'm, I'm still just as entertained by college football as I ever have been. Uh, I promise you this, no matter how much this sports changes, I'll probably still be the last man standing. It's, it would take a lot to ever get me to like college football even one bit less than I currently do because of how much I love this sport. But uh, there's some big time questions that need to be asked. And some of the stuff happening around Florida State today is perhaps going to further some of those discussions or take them to an even weirder place, perhaps. So we'll pick up the discussion here. Watch the next couple of days. Maybe George in the transfer portal. Perhaps that's a possibility. Uh, it's Friday. No show for us on Monday. That's Christmas Day. So hopefully you guys are enjoying all of that. We're going to be pre-recorded in sort of a normal format on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, a little bit of a so it's that means back in the studio, things like that. Uh, so we're pre-recorded Tuesday and Wednesday, and then we're live here with you on Thursday from Miami, getting ready for the Orange Bowl. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you for you know we kind of roll through and do things a lot of different ways. Just thank you so much for being here and being a part of it. Uh, I just really, really appreciate that. It is the greatest Christmas gift. It's probably the only Christmas gift I truly want, which is the chance to be able to sit here and talk to all of you and have this chance to interact. I just truly appreciate it. So I hope this Christmas season is everything that you want it to be. I hope you get what you want. I hope your kids get what they want. I hope the food, the cookies, the the time, and uh, I just hope the memories are uh, really, really marvelous. Hope it's great. And I will look forward to seeing you back here again very soon on Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger. I hope you all have a great weekend and a wonderful, wonderful Christmas season. Talk to you soon, everybody.